Welcome to the very first Payday 2 Nuzlocke, with Yelwonk finally stepping into the shoes of Ash Ketchum and becoming the very best like no one ever was. In essence, this is a pacifist playthrough of Payday 2, where I try to complete the game's campaign, from the jewellery store to the White House, without killing anyone, at least not personally. Instead, I'll be using my team of six pay monsters to do the murdering for me. I told you this wasn't quite Pokemon as you remember it as a child, no softcore fainting taking place here. If you're not a Pokemon fan, just take this to be the pacifist run I promised a couple of years ago, with the added difficulty of trying to avoid the Pokemon Company's copyright strikes wherever possible. But if you are, prepare yourself for a never-before-imagined crossover as we work to steal every badge in the region and become the champions of Washington DC. But first, thank you to Manscaped, the men's grooming and hygiene specialist, for sponsoring today's video. Now I'm sure I'm not the only male haster out there who lives in fear of a fateful slip-up, not only in stealth, but also when tidying up those most delicate of areas. Fortunately, Manscaped have hooked me up with the perfect package 4.0. So far, the new Lawnmower 4.0, Manscaped's cordless, waterproof trimmer with advanced skin safe technology, has been a game changer. Not only is it incredibly safe to use, it's also conveniently portable with a triple tap travel lock feature and wireless charging dock. You'll also receive the innovative Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray to keep you hygienic and feeling refreshed the entire day. Don't forget the two free gifts you'll also receive when ordering for a limited time. If any of this has piqued your interest, head over to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use the promo code NOLI with 1k. Back with the challenge, of course, unlike Game Freak, we actually have to update our rules and required mechanics for every challenge run. Essentially, we cannot kill anyone via our own conscious action. That means no kills with primary, secondary, melee or throwable weapons. I've decided to throw a little jeopardy in there, as damage can still be dealt directly by the Jokemon trainer, but that damage cannot be lethal, else the heist is automatically failed, bringing a few more strategies to the table. That is to say, a Jokemon trainer is a pacifist in the sense that they don't believe in war, not that they won't partake in a little violence. You know how it is. Outside of that, our Jokemon include the Crew AI, Police Jokers and a single Sentry Turret. They are all able to deal damage and pick up kills and will be our primary means of getting things done. Of course at this point you might be asking what makes something a Jokemon? Well that's where the mods for today's run come in. Jokemon is a mod created by Hopip that I've been a long term admirer of, allowing you to capture, train and battle your Joked cops from one heist to another. This does give them the opportunity to become stronger than your average cop, however I'll be playing with the Nuzlocke mode turned on, meaning when they die, they die for good and will need to be replaced, just to add a little more risk to the challenge. Alongside that, bearing in mind I already know how virtually impossible kill heists such as Panic Room are for a challenge such as this, I'm going to preempt my own failure by adding a few quality of life enhancements for AI. Useful bots will allow us to give them more instructions and better targeting without really messing with their stats and creating an overpowered monster as we would with better bots. Bot weapons and equipment will allow us to customise our crew AI to make them more unique and memorable members of the team for this challenge. Kill feed will let us keep tabs on who's doing the most on the team, whilst keepers joker names will let me name my joker teammates just to make it that bit more upsetting when one of them dies. The naming scheme is of course going to be Pokemon related. Once again, huge shout out to Hopip for all of these creations. Finally, if things feel a little less interactive than I'd like them to, I'm going to call on one final AI mod, Keepers, which will give me far greater control over how my teammates position and fight around cover, but we'll see if that's necessary later on. Back to the rulebook, outside of the obvious mod and crew AI deviations, we'll be sticking to the usual format for the most part. That means we start at level 0, infamy 0, there is no out of heist grinding for money or levels outside of a new lifeline, and all heists must be played offline. Alongside the challenge specific mods, I'll still be allowing myself a hood mod, Vanilla Hood Plus, predominantly just to keep track of our Jokemon's kills. Finally, we will always play heist on the highest available difficulty, up to Death Wish, meaning Mayhem from level 0 to 79, and Death Wish from 80 upwards. Oh and yes, I will still have to be a pacifist on stealth only heist. Wish me luck with that. Despite not needing them in the previous run, lifelines are back, but look quite different this time around. With Crew AI already allowed for this run, that means we need to add a new lifeline in its place. I've gone thematic this time with the Power Grind lifeline. This allows me to repeat any previously completed heist just once at any time in order to receive an additional payday and XP drop for the team. I've also decided to get rid of the Phone a Friend lifeline as it sort of breaks the team size limit I've imposed, instead adding the Rule Breaker. This allows me to bend the rules in one possible way for a single heist. That is to say, I can't simply remove the challenge rules for a heist, but I can alter an element of them. 
For example, in a run where I cannot kill anyone, I can't remove the pacifist stipulation entirely, but I can for instance allow myself a meager one murder per minute, or freedom to kill bulldozers specifically. This was a community suggestion that I really like the sound of, so it joins drop difficulty and power grind to form this run's legendary trio of lifelines. That said, yeah, once well, going round in circles once again, so with this fresh start, let's go catch them all. After the reset, before heading into a heist this time around, I need to work out the foundations of the squad that's going to turn DC into a cesspit of crime that would make Team Rocket blush, or whilst I feign ignorance as the world's least dedicated pacifist. First on the team, we have our starter, Dallas. Always the most popular in the polls, he's the veritable Charizard of this team and will be depended on at all levels. For the most part, I'll be equipping him with shotguns for that close range DPS. Next up we have Hoxton, always dependable, always there for us, except when Overkill tried to cut him without explanation. He's the Pikachu of the team, with his all-purpose fully auto playstyle, sticking to ARs and LMGs to rip through the visors of bulldozers. Finally, for the crew AI squad, I could never leave Jimmy on the bench. My favourite mischief maker is absolutely a poison type with all those substances coursing through his veins. For this run, I'll be equipping him with snipers as soon as possible. The other three members we'll have to go out and catch in the field, but as for ourselves, the closest thing to the ageless Ash Ketchum is the boy Wonder Sokol. No, he's not permanently 10 years old, but how can you argue with a baby face like that? Hell, I even went out and spent £2.50 for a goddamn baseball cap to complete the look. If that isn't dedication, I don't know what is. With our boy now rightly dressed for the occasion, I head into the loud tutorial heist as for once I'm actually allowed to bring my crew along with me. Despite the fact that the tutorial isn't meant to teach you exactly how to shoot things, my squad were more than happy to get their hands dirty immediately. Although, because we're forced to play as Dallas here, apparently we've briefly added Jacket to the squad. Neither Day 1 nor Day 2 offered any tangible challenge at normal difficulty, meaning this was a quick and easy springboard onto bigger things. Now it's time to work out the all-important build. For once, first aid kits won't be an immediate necessity as I can go down and be rescued by the crew AI. This means that I can instead grab some drill and carry utility skills, as well as unlocking access to jokers. I also had just enough cash to pick up a few cheaper weapons, with the Predator 12 gauge actually being one of the top shotguns for AI thanks to the bot weapons and equipment mod. I also started specialising into Sicario as the smoke grenade would be an invaluable tool for this pacifist playstyle. With that, I decided to head into the bank heist for attempt number 1. It probably makes sense to now explain the additional side objectives I've challenged myself to complete throughout this run. First, I want at least one of my jokers to hit level 100, the maximum available with this mod. That means I will really have to fight to keep them alive for long enough to make it there. Second, I want to catch them all so to speak, capturing at least one of each core joker variation we see on the wiki or FBI files. We'll keep tabs on that progress throughout the video. But for now, it seems we have a fated encounter, as after quite a bit of persuasion, we capture our very first Jokemon, a shiny level 36 beat cop. I don't know what the exact chance for cops to spawn in with this effect is, but that's still pretty damn cool. Sadly, this guy was not ready for a spot on Yelwant's roster, spending the first half of the heist shooting directly into a wall, and then the second half dead on the floor. Rest in peace, unnamed Jokemon, you will not be remembered in half an hour's time. Fortunately though, even without a fourth ally, as Nuzlocke rules prevented me from converting another one, the crew were able to protect me long enough to grab a bag of cash from the vault and escape with relative ease. This early loss hit Yelwonk hard, turning to drink and gambling, before remembering that he could just specialise into more controller skills to actually keep future teammates alive. I was also cheered by the discovery that thanks to mods we could equip crew AI with akimbo weaponry. That's damn cool and should really be a base game feature. Up now though, Jewelry Store is the next roadblock to progression, and this time we're able to pick up a level 38 genset SWAT and a level 33 genset heavy. The heavies in particular tend to be much more robust due to their armour, so seem to be a great addition to the team. I won't lie, I played this heist appallingly, abusing the power of my crew to force a loot into the back of the van even when I had no right to. You might also notice that with the Jokemon, I'm able to recall my light SWAT to get him out of a tricky situation before sending him back out in cover. This mechanic is the key to become a decent Jokemon trainer. With a bit of tenacity and a few too many downs for my liking, I smashed my head against this one all the way to the escape, and with two surviving Jokers, it was time for the first naming ceremony. Meet Pikachu and Bulbasaur. Look, I'm trying to do this challenge without googling any names, and clearly my Pokemon knowledge is a little stretched by this challenge. In any case, at level 37, I was also able to develop my build further with Shockproof to avoid any nasty manslaughter accidents and equip the buzzer, bearing in mind we can deal damage, I just need to be careful not to actually tase anyone to death. 
GoBank is usually a nightmare, but with my crew AI set up to focus down snipers in preparation for Panic Room, it wasn't quite as hard as I was expecting. Over the course of this one, we grabbed another two level 32 swats, with the Shotgunner in particular going to work, earning their first level ups of this run, before we could use our newly purchased saw to secure the cash in decent time. With that performance, he'd earned himself the name Charizard, but the heavy disappointed a little bit and graduated as a Magikarp. At least I was able to pick up Hostage Taker at this point, granting me some serious passive healing and allowing me to switch over to the final team member, the Sentry Gun. With at least third lore race, this little guy was surprisingly hard to take down, meaning it could be an excellent supporting member of the crew immediately. I also swore off ever bringing the medic bag on a heist again, as all it did was encourage me to play like a lunatic and go down without repercussions. Going loud on the diamond store, nearly saw me punished for this adaptation immediately. Sheer numbers made it difficult to start moving the bags through the rear of the store, and a SWAT turret peppered me inside the building, going down multiple times without any access to healing. Fortunately, I was able to secure a couple more higher level Jokemon to cover my escape and confirm all 14 required bags of jewelry. You might wonder why I'm heading through these early heists at such a breakneck pace. Well, if the remaining runtime is anything to go by, you might have half an idea why. Early game, on Mayhem, the crew are just a little overpowered in my opinion, but that won't be the case forever, so we should enjoy it while it lasts and catch as many Jokemon as possible to shore up the ranks. I also finally worked out the priority system to send out Charizard first, just like every 7 year old did when playing the games for the first time. The transport heists were an excellent opportunity to pick up some rare additions to the team, adding a level 40 FBI agent, later named after my favourite Pokemon, Swallet, who actually seemed to have excellent DPS potential. With drills and saws, armoured transports were never really going to slow me down, clearing the underpass easily, before making similar work of the harbour. This was actually the first heist where I chose not to make new team additions, instead aiming to train Swallow and Charizard into the 40s. The train heist has historically been one I attempt to stealth with limited success, so instead I went in with full blooded intent and a crew of bodyguards to defend me, capturing my first secret service agent Jokemon to further my Joker decks, as well as the rare yellow heavy SWAT, seldom seen on higher difficulties. At one point in this heist, I noticed a couple of guns coming out of my chest. Apparently, I was cozying up with a taser, who nearly forced me to commit my first homicide of this run. Fortunately, my conscienceless machine was able to get the job done for me, free of any guilt. That wasn't the only close call though on this behemoth of a heist. At one point, I was dropped to grey screen and need to flank around half the map to reach the asset place doctor's bag. A little bit of luck here, but we absolutely take those. Whilst I was distracted by a reminder of my mortality, the SWAT started to move the turret parts themselves, which I gave them a light round of BDSM and stole the bags right off their backs. Honestly, the ammo bag moving section was just so tedious, it's hardly worth your time, although I was forced to flex the majority of our roster to make it through a heist of this length. That moves us onto Vlad's heist and more Crasher, where I made a giga impact on the windows before holding out in the wine store. Jimmy's request, apparently. I was surprised by how easy this one was, considering I forgot to heal up my jokers before heading out. Yes, you have to spend money to keep your guys in battle-ready condition. Not ideal when I was still saving up for those high-tier crew weapons, such as the Thanatos for Jimmy. Four Stores is also fodder for the crew, where I was able to grab my first standard security guard just for completeness sake. Ukrainian Job is yet another drill waiting game, but an important one as it was here I caught another beat cop, specifically the Bronco wielding one. Most of you will be familiar with just what these guys can do to a heister, so let's hope his pure power is similar when he joins my roster of jokers. Annoyingly, I was forced onto an escape after this one, but with my crew acting as sniper killing hotshots, the rooftop location wasn't ever going to challenge us. Once back in the Jokemon Center, I decided to make a few adjustments to my team order, keeping Charizard and Swallows as top dogs, but also giving promotions to Firo, the Bronco Cop, and Typhlosion, the impressive security guard from Four Stores. With these guys on board, I was able to make short work of yet another Vlad heist, White Xmas, one of the few heists with scripted blue swap spawns who I was able to take advantage of to fill out another page in the decks. I'm not sure how the Pokemon company would feel about me bringing together their cute and marketable creatures with heists involving pure Colombian cocaine, but we just won't tell them that now, will we? Back on track, it's time for a heist with even more jeopardy than I initially realised, Meltdown. This one's regularly tough with its sprawling layout and sneakily placed snipers, but for us, there was an entirely unique challenge, avoiding vehicular manslaughter whilst travelling in a forklift truck. Unfortunately, this is the first failed attempt of the run after this SWAT got his ankle clipped and went down like he was appealing for a penalty. Frustrating, but it just meant I needed to play with a little more caution on the next try. By the way, I usually allow vehicle kills in my runs, but usually, killing in general isn't frowned upon. I'm not sure how the courts would have seen it, but I'm choosing to hold the L this time around. 
On the second run, I once again picked up a murky water choker for the collection, and this time rolled my warhead laden forklift truck so carefully there wouldn't be chance for another accident. I also spared the life of my second shiny cop, a heavy swat this time, who I brought back with me just for the prestige. Once the lad stepped outside and started to clear a path for me, it was much easier to edge forwards, using my sentry as a guilt shield. Except this little guy could do more than just block negative emotions. With its built-in protective shield, it was the perfect antidote to SWAT turrets, drawing all their ire away from my more fleshy and fragile crew. Its role as the distractor for the gang was cemented on this heist, as I'm ashamed its sacrifice for the greater good will probably become a theme moving forwards. Aftershock is another risky heist when it comes to not running things over, but other than that, it's a million times easier with a whole posse to distract the responders. I now had a slew of sentry turret upgrades, so we're running at pretty much full capacity at this point. My only fall came at the hands of a sniper, with this heist very much feeling like a training exercise for my jokers, with Firo, Swallowed and Charizard all leveling up multiple times over the course of it. By now, we were cruising. Nightclub is a bit of a snooze fest as I've made clear recently, but at least Jimmy was able to pop off with his shiny new toy the Thanatos 50 cal, managing to turn the beer barrel room into lavender town for the Washington PD. Next up, I headed into Stealing Xmas and grabbed a second shotgun SWAT to give Charizard a little competition for his place, who I just about saved to fight another day from the rooftop. The issue is, the most damaging cops seem to also be the most fragile, so when we jump up in difficulty, I'll have to be real quick on the Joker ball to keep them alive heist to heist. Sicario's smoke trivializes most objectives on this one though, making for yet another swift getaway. I'm going to absolutely shoot through Hector's jobs now as we're painfully close to the moment I know you're waiting for when things should go awry. Watch Dogs is a brilliant heist for adding entries to the Joker decks. Not only can we pick up a rare FBI agent on day one, but after reaching the escape car on day two, we can also spot the almost extinct hostage rescue team SWAT. Trust me when I say for a payday player, this is like coming across a legendary Pokemon in the wild. Bag carrying is usually frustrating on some of these older heists, but the boys make it a cinch, allowing for a quick and easy day two clear. Day one of Firestarter is a complete gimme, for all those reasons I've already explained, especially as I'm packing C4 for their entirely pacifist use of shape charges. On day two, the buzzer finally earns its place in the build, as I tase a cloak amid charge before leaving him to the wolves. No, I'm not an accessory to murder, stop suggesting that. Day 3 is just another bank heist, absolutely nothing to write home about. I was mainly using these heists to test the efficacy of all the weapons I could hand to my AI. The Thanatos was winning that race. On Rats Day 1, we were cocking up a little more than just a low poly sandwich, but I'm fairly sure the gang and I were able to prevent cops from even entering the meth lab, making for a very simple clear. As was the case with our multi-story escapers, I was able to load up the crew with the loot and then simply rush out on my own, instead of this becoming a nightmarish bag juggling exercise as it had been in the past. On day 2, I tried throwing swallows at the gang members, who were understandably not impressed. Still, more money in the bank to heal up the boys. Day 3 was only notable as there are set spawns for heavy response units, meaning it was my best chance to add another SWAT variation to the team. Other than that, Hector's jobs were over in what has to be record time. The elephant comes into the picture now with Big Oil Day 1 bringing my first ever crash. Apparently Firo is not well liked at the biker hideout. Restarting Payday seemed to fix things though, as my now level 66 Joker went to town clearing out the map and making room for me to escape with the address of Day 2. This one was always going to be a lot more difficult, with stealth being a requirement in the past just to avoid the constant power breaks when playing solo. Fortunately, I am now supported by a robust team of 6 maniacs, sentry turret included, meaning that I could station them on each power source to protect the hack and gain access to the engines. Tragically, about 8.5 minutes into this one, the sentry gun finally met its match in a green dozer, holding him off for some time before eventually being flanked and overwhelmed. Don't panic, we can rebuild him. I must have spent about 10 minutes searching for the final part of the engine equation on this one, only to find it in the exact same room I found the first notebook. Exceptional observation skills, as ever. Still, with the endless ammo supply of my teammates, the length of the heist was hardly even an issue as we held out poolside before securing escape via the plane. Now that brings us on to Framing Frame, where, somewhat unprompted, I went for a stealthy clear thanks to the guards not hearing entire glass windows smashing and the ECM jammer I was now packing with jack of all trades. This meant that no ambush occurred on day two, and I was able to head into the third day rested and ready for a fight. Just like Big Oil, if you can't hold down the power boxes, this too can be a bit of a mess in loud, but I was fortunately able to set up a perimeter around the file override and hold down just about every floor of the building by splitting up the crew. Jokers and Sentry on the roof, crew AI downstairs. I won't lie, something about this playstyle is kinda cool. I feel more like I'm playing a real-time strategy game than an action first-person shooter, and I suppose if we were looking to align genres, RTSs are at least a little closer to Pokemon than Payday is. 
I also secured my first accessible shiny on this heist, another elite SWAT who wouldn't exactly be a powerhouse but would at least look cool when sent in to be fodder. With that, we cleared framing frame and actually hit level 80. This is by far the fastest I've ever made it to this level, which was courtesy of the XP bonuses we were receiving during the winter update. Now this might sound like a huge advantage due to all the extra skill points we were earning earlier in the run, but with this key milestone hit, it was also time to move up the difficulty to Death Wish, a frightening proposition, but one I wasn't quite content with. Let's be honest, this has been the easiest challenge run so far. I've blitzed virtually every single heist and the only failure to write home about was caused by a little dangerous driving. I know my community, you all live for jeopardy, and I wasn't about to let all those Pokemon Nuzlockers and challenge runners down with their wildly difficult runs. I decided to make an executive call. If election day on Death Wish was similarly easy, we'd take things up to death sentence for the rest of the run. No turning back. To really figure this one out, we of course had to go loud on day one, something I'm not sure I've done in about 8 years. Now whilst I could absolutely feel the spike up in difficulty, especially with minigun dozers spawning in and proving to be a serious threat against non-armored jokers, at the same time it was very manageable, escaping day 1 without going down a single time. Admittedly day 2 was even more chaotic and I absolutely felt like I was at the mercy of Payday's random spawn system, too many dozers at once and it would be all over, as once again my poor sentry found out the hard way. Honestly, the only thing that could cheer me up was this mime cloaker getting punished for kicking thin air. But then, an even greater tragedy occurred. The unnamed security guard I'd captured on this very heist was ambushed by wild cops and taken down. I really hadn't accounted for the jump up in damage. In my grief, I looked to immediately replace him with a more defensive heavy SWAT, forgetting that I already had two jokers out, automatically sacrificing poor Golduck as kindling for this new acquisition. Absolutely heartbreaking and completely my fault. Being a two day heist and not allowing me to heal jokers in between, I was forced to use a bunch of rockies from the bench to keep forging on through this heist. But fortunately, Close Quarters suits the Core AI excellently, with Jimmy apparently cosplaying as Pikachu for this one in honour of the run. Eventually, the drill broke us into the vault, which was empty, earning the fairly rare Murphy's Law achievement, but actually saving me from having to transport anything out of this heist, allowing for the perfect high speed getaway. Now, I told myself that if I didn't die, we'd be amping up the difficulty for this run alone, and whilst a few of my allies did drop to the Death Wish difficulty, I still want to up the ante. Here it is, my first death sentence challenge run begins now. Let's hope I'm not self-destructing with that decision. In preparation for this fateful moment, I finished perk 9 of Sicario, at least granting me a complete perk deck for the trials to come. I also set the crew AI boys up with their main loadouts for the rest of the run, with the Predator 12 gauge on Dallas, Brenner on Hawks, and their R93 or Thanatos on Jimmy. Prep complete, it was now time for Big Bank on death sentence. The one great thing about upping the difficulty was that this also increased the power of wild jokers, allowing me to capture a zeal heavy SWAT at a much higher level who immediately proved to be a cut above anything else we'd seen. However, the damage on this difficulty is absolutely nightmarish, just as my sentry which lasted for all of 5 seconds this time. However, Sicario is a top tier deck for death sentence, granting absolutely insane levels of dodge that make it possible to force through objectives which might have been otherwise out of reach. It was far from foolproof though, as I was getting dropped from across the map repeatedly, forcing me into my limited healing reserves. Wishing I didn't ban bringing my own doctor's bags at this point, won't lie. But as I'd gone for Thermite over the BFD, I was basically able to hide out whilst the crew did the heavy lifting. The only caveat now is that cops have enough DPS to actually take my boys down, meaning their absolutely awful positioning is going to cause me a bit of a headache from here on in. Still, they were plenty strong enough to create the space I needed to access the vault and start shifting the loot. After bag 1 was secured, the magnitude of the task I just set myself started to sink in, as did the potential heartbreak we were about to face as both the heavy shotgun of Zapdos and our OG powerhouse Charizard were mercilessly cut down whilst I was incapacitated and unable to recall them. Things were looking really dire at this point, but Dallas managed to single-handedly rescue the entire situation. After healing up, I thought I was in the clear, but no, I put myself directly into the staircase of death. Here I was physically body blocked and prevented from leaving, with the punishment only getting worse as Taurus joined his friends in the little Jokemon Center in the sky. Honestly, there was no escape, even with the protection of a New Zeal friend, I was unable to move. But here's where the miracle happened. Somehow, the remaining gang of three managed to pick themselves out of that death trap and hold out for the end of the assault wave, trading one of the few remaining hostages for the life of their trainer. 
This opportunity wasn't wasted. Metapod acted as the vanguard whilst I scrambled to get all three remaining bags down into the elevator, saving this heist from the jaws of defeat. Are you not entertained? We've gone from having nothing to talk about to an entire 450 word paragraph and a mounter of joker deaths at our feet. I required a serious reshuffle of the troops after this, knighting my New Zeal heavies as Empoleon and Badoof. Remember that name. But trust me, even with these new powerful allies at my side, things aren't likely to get easier anytime soon. It's Hotline Miami next, a heist that's a bit of a race against the clock early on day one. On my first attempt, I think it's safe to say the clock won, as I found myself going down before even burning up the Commissar's cars, a surefire restart at this stage. I had a little more agility on attempt 2, cutting down the Commissar's men with the most direct indirect method of killing a man, please don't question my ethics. Here is also where I learned that minigun doses are kinda hard work for the boys. 48,000 health is a fair amount, and I was absolutely going to be at the mercy of not facing down four of them at once, as we know Payday sometimes likes to do to you. I had another close call at the gas station, but was actually able to reset this time heading back off Assault to get me out of the open. I got some mega dodge luck in picking up the cable to rip open the basement door, and from there was at least able to take a bit of a backseat. Whilst in search of the correct address for day 2, I did get myself into a bit of a predicament, going down whilst trying to reach the meds, but thanks to a recent respec into Stockholm Syndrome, once every heist I'll have a get out of jail free card to use so long as we have some hostages on the map. This was the lifeline I needed to make a break for the escape, flanking around to the ECM jammer to clear what was a relatively safe passage out. Great, except half my Jokemon had been put on the verge of fainting permanently. This set day 2 up to be a real struggle. Attempt 1 though went unbelievably well, I was able to hold out in the right side room using the cover of the fire blast to protect the drill from the cops. Amazing, until I opened up the commissar's vault. Foolishly, I forgot that my teammates wouldn't just follow me into the fire, running in alone with just my sentry gun, which resulted in an agonizingly slow death as my crew went down one by one. Despite saving Stockholm Syndrome, there was remarkably little I could get done on my own, and although the sentry gun did take the Commissar down, I foolishly went for the Hail Mary hero play, forgetting that I'd lost my fast interaction speed, failing to revive Jimmy in time, and completely throwing the run. Honestly, watching this back, I'm almost certain that we would have made it out just by chilling within the safe room until Bile arrived. But hindsight is 2020. As is so often the case with promising runs, after getting inches away from a first time clear, for all follow up attempts, I was getting hyper beam back down to the minor leagues. On run 2 I ended up getting burned to death, if you're wondering whether Yawant learns from his mistakes. On 3, I tried to learn by turning on the sprinklers, which instead turned the penthouse floor into a writhing mass of angry cops, meaning I couldn't fix the drill in peace. However, after much frustration and disappointment, I managed to pull things together for attempt 4. Despite an absolutely abysmal start requiring an early medic bag use, I was able to execute the hide in the corner and let your handsome teammates carry you strategy, occasionally throwing out smoke and shouting words of encouragement, just like a real Pokemon trainer. Although I'd lost my sentry early on, I was able to capture a very powerful level 68 zeal who was absolutely the MVP here. They bought me just enough time to get the vault open, run to the sprinklers with ECM feedback for cover, and let the crew at the Commissar. But with all the dozer risks on the map, it was actually the brand new Zeal recruit who got the job done for us, whilst the rest of the crew threw everything they had at just not dying. What a clutch opening performance, I'm sure that joker will be rewarded with a name fitting their already grandiose achievements. I called him Miltank, don't ask me why. Alongside this newly added High Lactose teammate, we also christened our canine, Pinsir and Kingler, promoting all of them towards the top of the team. But the difficulty I'd had with that heist wouldn't be quickly forgotten. Before heading into the always challenging Hotston breakout, I needed something to make my crew a little less unruly and let's face it, stupid. There's only so many times I can handle my jokers wandering out into a firing squad. It's time to call on Keepers, a mod that will not only make my AI more intelligent and actually able to take cover, it will also give me more tools to make commands as their trainer. Now I have the ability to take where my AI will stand and patrol from a distance, meaning I don't always have to be the one rushing headfirst into combat. This is essential for Hotstone Breakout, although I have to admit, it took a while to wrap my head around these new command hotkeys. 
We ran directly into the SWAT van Roblox first up, which is usually a run killer, but with Sicario's smoke and my crew creating an impressive distraction, it was surprisingly easy to get the van moving again. The next road was not so simple though, with the sort of sightlines that I can do nothing about. At death's door, I persevered though, dropping my ECM, quick popping Stockholm Syndrome, and forcing onto the parking garage. Once inside, it was just a case of soaring open the right door, letting my motley gang of strangely dressed allies take down the dozer, and clear a path to day two. Here I was able to convert both variants of the FBI agent who make up the first wave of hostility, going down twice in the process, and choosing to use my keycard on the first aid room to heal up. This high should suit my team, who work best at close range, where they have a harder time missing, and with my sentry acting as the perfect distraction, we were able to hold down the control room easily enough. Rushing to the further afield objectives did come with other perils though, especially for my turret, which once again bit the bullet first. Whilst this was a huge loss that would throw off my previous strategy, thanks to my speed and dodge, at least I was able to stay alive. That was until things turned real bleak. The ominous prophecy came to fruition as an army of bulldozers all decided to spawn at once. With three medic dozers chaining revives, it was extremely obvious that we didn't have the firepower to break through that source of healing. All I could do was try and keep myself afloat with meds and keep reviving the boys. Unbelievably, this sort of worked, with the server objective giving us an excuse to flee to the operations room and spread out the lumbering seven bulldozers that were currently on the map. This wasn't without sacrifice, as a pair of early catches, including Dragonite, the hostage unit, and Bulbasaur, one of my original two, went down as valiant sacrifices to make room for the rest of the team. Eventually, the seven dozers were reduced to three, but I was also left with virtually no health from the battle. It was now I decided to fight rather than flee. Totodile sadly joined the recently departed, but once we set up in the med bay, it was possible to funnel the cops in one by one and retake control over the situation. We held off for just long enough to reach the end of the assault and started the final escape with the server. Here I was forced to use the Stockholm Syndrome charge I was holding onto, but this was enough to move to the escape and make a massive first time clear after nearly 25 minutes. If the crew can hold off seven doses at once, what can't they do, eh? Well, I'd argue they're not the best at stealth, so once again I went into Hotston Revenge loud. This is an assassination heist, just like Hotline Miami, so it's a good job I have a vast array of wannabe assassins queuing up on my team. First, I took an FBI safehouse guard as my own, as at the very least these guys have a unique name for the decks. Then, after finding Hector's vault, I made a truly mad dash for the drill, using my ECM to convert the SWAT turret. This bought just enough time for the boys to join me outside, where a seriously crazy scramble of chain revives and panic began. Somehow, the upshot of all of this was that I made it back inside the house, only to go to custody and Stockholm my way straight back out again. Oh, and Pincer joined the Fallen. Not my finest play, I'll admit. But it did get the drill inside the fence, which was itself enough for me to recover it and get the process started. After a few close calls, once again caused by dozers being given effectively unlimited health by medics, we ended up with a strange bedroom situation involving four dozers and a traitorous Colombian. Not a pleasant Friday evening, at least not for Hector, with Dallas getting the pleasure of taking him down personally. Thing is, that's the easy part of this heist. Securing the six bags of evidence is where things get really interesting. After the battle of the bedroom, I failed to notice how wounded Empoleon was, meaning we lost yet another powerful Joker, but his sacrifice wasn't in vain, as I was able to flank back round to where he went down and start moving bags from the rooftops. At one point, things looked really grim, but under the cover of ECM feedback, I was once again able to dodge the lasers and reach the medic bag just in time. With two more lives in me, I had just enough juice to get back up on the rooftop, secure the last bit of loot, and escape not a moment too soon. That was quite a scramble. But with the experience it earned, I was able to expand my usefulness to the team with the Ace High Value Target skill. Usually, this is used to just increase the team's damage against specials, but here, I could use it alongside my AI mods to influence their targeting priority, meaning I could finally give them attack commands. As the diamond is one of those heists that rarely gives me any trouble, it was a perfect test for this strategy to hold down everything we needed to protect. Over the course of this heist, a powerful partnership between Badoof and Milk Tank started to blossom, with both really pulling their weight with kills. This gave me all the room I needed to access the diamond exhibit, actually memorize a pattern for once, and blindly make an escape from the vault room. From there, it was just a simple holdout into completion. This brings us on to the dentist's final job, the Golden Green Casino. I decided that a heavily upgraded BFD was the way to go on this one, as most of the favours just sped things up and didn't make things easier for a pacifist like myself. From the start, I took a casino agent hostage to again add to my future ranks, before accessing the C4 and exposing the vault. 
Honestly, I was shocked by just how smoothly things were going. For once, I wasn't snapped to oblivion outside and we were able to quickly set up for the BFD. Here's where Keepers really shows its value as I'm able to send out the crew to clear space for me to complete objectives in relative peace, and then specifically task them with holding down certain areas of interest. This makes defending the drill and power supply smooth sailing when compared to prior runs. I mean, take a look, my allies are so potent I was basically able to hide in the toilet for most of the drilling section, only taking brief peeks out to refill the water cooler. This was so effective that the BFD kept going without being interrupted once. Of course, I still managed to almost get myself killed, but after that quick scare, there was really only one outcome, a full first time clear on death sentence. And the craziest thing, both of my jokers actually picked up more kills than Hoxton and Dallas. The whole crew was genuinely outperforming most online teammates, myself probably included. I was so high on confidence that I thought I could take on the world, and by the world, I mean the bomb forest. I have no idea what possessed me to think that was a good idea. Being one of the most open maps in the game, it's not exactly conducive for playing a pacifist. As a result, I was easy prey for the SWATs. I threw in the towel early on run 1, went the distance on run 2 but was rejected once I tried to run the bags down the hill. Honestly, slowing down my AI with the bomb parts here was probably the mistake I made, as alone, I'm nothing. Even with all the tools in my arsenal, I wasn't able to salvage things, the heist ending after my second trip to police custody. Third time around, I ended up completely caught out in one of the train carts, losing all my remaining resources for this heist and going into custody without a hostage to trade me back. The forest was off the cards, but the dockyard at least had promise. On this attempt, I was able to channel the vestiges of the spy run, stealthing the keycard section, which cut over 5 minutes off the heist. Although I was spotted on my way to the second station, I'd done enough to open up the docks, meaning all we needed to do was hold down the terminal and then break into the ship. With the whole gang pushing together, it was surprisingly easy for me to secure a victory road back to the helicopter with the bomb parts. Sometimes, I wonder why I do things the hard way. Next up, it's Scarface Mansion, and I'd like to point out that the boys really dressed up for this one. With the bot weapons and equipment mod, we can set the crew AI to spawn with randomised outfits and customised masks. Honestly, some of these designs are amazing if you're looking for inspiration for my next Payday Mask competition. I found it pretty refreshing seeing the guys with a different unique look from heist to heist, it really helped me get over the monotony of failing repeatedly. Oh, right on time. Like an idiot, I decided to flank all the way around the map to rescue Hoxton who apparently had gotten lost, only for him to be inspired up by Jimmy and me to be left in no man's land. I assumed I was still in the clear with Stockholm Syndrome yet unused, but I forgot the most important part of the equation, actually having a hostage to trade for me. Oops. Now well, on the second try I was easily able to regain access to the Sosa Sanctum, take out the security and gradually bring down the man himself. That wasn't the real challenge here though, as ever, it's the bags that break me, as a chain reaction of death and destruction ensued after my wild break for it. First, Magikarp died whilst all I could do is watch, and then Squirtle was absolutely demolished. I'm not sure I've seen a Joker's health bar drop that quickly ever before. The tragedies continued as my rare shiny Oddish took one for the team, protecting our rear, and in the heat of that carnage we only managed to bring 3 bags total to the van, meaning I had to run back whilst we had a break in the assault. I knew the risks, but I also had hostages, meaning I could be traded back immediately. With this new lease of life, I was once again able to make a run for the escape, but just like last time, there would need to be sacrifices for this brighter tomorrow. Not only did run MVP Jimmy go into custody, we lost Pidgey who'd remained at his side until the end. In what I can only assume to be some sort of state of shell shock, Dallas then refused to carry over the final loot bag until snapping back into action after Snorlax was also taken down, holding off cops at the courtyard. Seriously, this one turned into some sort of XCOM mission with half the crew losing their goddamn minds. Eventually though, Dallas braved the open, treading over the bodies of his fallen comrades to finally bring us those sweet, sweet drugs. It's moments like these where you wonder if it's all worth it. At least the two new recruits we brought in, Diglett and Doug Trio, could bolster our numbers when we needed them the most. Thankfully, 20 levels of crime spree are never difficult to obtain. In fact, by re-rolling, I was able to head back into an armoured transport heist to pick up the rare red genset security guard I'd missed out on earlier, an easy clear to break up the brutal losses our team was taking. Next up we have Counterfeit, which can be challenging solo due to the spread of open objectives, but with the Dream Team, it was an infinitely easier setup. This one felt like a nice grinding heist for the emerging team leaders at this point, Miltank and Bidoof, who were both nearing level 90 by the end of it. One thing I haven't really touched on is how helpful the increased interaction speed is thanks to having Crew AI with me. On a heist like this, the sewer escape usually causes problems with its fixed spawning doses, but as I'm able to open the gate in one quarter of the time here, it's simply not an issue. 
First World Bank is hot on counterfeit's tail, and once again let the crew show their strength. This is the first time they've really conquered a multiple minigun dozer spawn, which was a big relief. My sentry gun also did a valiant job holding off the cops from the computer hack all on its own, which was worthy of a rescue. The second half of this heist was made even easier when a shield fell in the perfect location for me to simply take cover and essentially go AFK whilst the boys got the job done. I did go down a couple of times, but moving the money wasn't that tricky thanks to my evasion going through the roof when I made this sprint over to the doctor's bag. It's crazy what having Stockholm Syndrome does to the risk-taking part of your brain. Despite Dallas somehow finding his way into custody, I was able to simply sprint down to the basement, witnessing another legendary hostage unit sighting before safely securing the money. This brings us onto our first stealth-only heist in Murky Station. Due to all the bonus Christmas XP, I had a ton of perk points to spend on Yakuza, which helped speed up the process. Even with a stealth perk deck though, I still managed to fail a few times, sparing in mind I have to remain a pacifist. I promise that's the only reason I'd ever fail a heist like this, definitely not due to any self-immolation incidents. In any case, I eventually got it together and secured the two EMP parts without being spotted at all. Which brings us on to Boiling Point, usually one of the hardest heists in the game, but uniquely for this run, one of the easiest, as Overkill have never added death sentence damage to the unique Russian forces. Speaking of those forces, I of course needed to secure a light and heavy for my available collection. But after that, genuinely this wasn't a difficult heist, with my only downs coming at the end when the snipers picked me off. Other than that, we were able to cruise through in just over 10 minutes. That leaves us taking down Santa's workshop, another heist that goes almost without a hitch, with my only down coming right at the escape, even though it was looking pretty grim for the boys right when I made it out. Car Shop is the second heist which mandates stealth, but didn't cause any problems as the hostages in the meeting room were apparently never spotted. A simple first time clear, where for once I could drive freely without worrying about running anyone over. But that takes us onto my least favourite heist in the game. The biker heist always seems to claim several hours of my time on these challenges, and on this occasion, it's looking no different. I did specialise into more ECM skills to try and keep the SWAT turret off my back, but to be honest, I'm not sure I agree with how they interact with the turrets. Why not convert them over the duration of the feedback, not just when initially placed? Ah well, it was never going to be enough on run 1, where I ended up getting caught out next to the seat objective and going down without a remaining hostage. I didn't get much further on run 2. Despite being able to use the sentry gun as a great turret distraction, it was the regular heist cops that seemed to be doing the real damage, taking down the entire team in under 5 minutes. In fact, if I didn't know otherwise, I'd swear the cops just deal more damage on this heist, as for once it seemed like I wasn't the only team member in constant need of a medic back. For run 4, I did adapt somewhat, setting up in the building opposite the mechanic to defend him from a more robust, defensible position, but even if I could protect him successfully, the objectives that forced me out of my safe space were the real issue, leading to another failure out in the open, and then once again in the clubhouse with the SWAT turret claiming Jimmy and Dallas's lives this time around. On attempt 6, we went on a rollercoaster of emotions as the whole gang got taken down, on a wild trip towards the doctor's bag, only to be resuscitated thanks to a clutch Stockholm Syndrome situation. Later, it was the crew's turn to go clutch, bringing me back from the beyond to somehow make it all the way to fixing up the bike. But instead of waiting for the end of the assault wave like a normal person, I was so coiled up by the events of the past hour, I sprung straight onto the bike and made it all of 2 meters before getting myself and the crew completely decimated. With one more failed scramble in front of the bunker objective, I decided it was time to change up the strategy. At this point, I decided to ask an all-important ethical question. Does violence against machines count as violence at all? I decided, for the sake of my precious Jokemon, the few bullets into a turret wouldn't be breaking any of the rules, so I switched up the build to add in a little crit. To tell the truth, the time I spent pondering this was completely wasted, as I didn't have the damage to come close to destroying the hunk of junk in the first place. On the plus side, all my recent failures had given my two Joker leaders the experience to race their way up to level 100, meaning if I was failing this challenge here, at least I'd managed to achieve one of my side quests. On this attempt though, in the end, the loss of skills hit me pretty hard as I'd given up on Stockholm Syndrome, relying on the crew to bring myself and Jimmy back, but those hopes were dashed as the final hostages were freed by the cops. A tough loss to take that was followed up by yet another after only 3 minutes. Here, my beloved Miltank was saved by the bell as the entire crew went into custody, failing the heist but saving its life. Shortly after, I fell yet again at the door of the bunker, before the straw that broke the camel's back. This time, things went perfectly, I completed all the hardest objectives without losing any allies, and the bike was finished and ready to ride at just the perfect time, right as the assault wave ended. But even so, I was still cut down and needed to flank around to replenish my health before trying again. 
I got the bike around the corner of the clubhouse, smoked it out for extra dodge, but out of that smoke came the death of a run. A pair of heavy swats had placed themselves directly in front of its handlebars, and by rolling forwards, I did the unthinkable. I killed two men at about three miles an hour. It's there in writing to prove it. The end of the most promising attempt. This was the wake up call I needed to get real and dip into my lifelines for the first time on this run. As early as it was, it was time for drop difficulty and my single heist return to Deathwish. This was exactly the breathing room I needed. Don't get me wrong, things weren't easy, but I could cope where before it often seemed impossible. We held out through 15 minutes of objectives before again grabbing the bike and riding it as slowly as humanly possible through the courtyard. I was picked off numerous times on the escape and was forced to let young Pikachu and Trico die, meaning the second of our two starters had fallen, but their sacrifice was enough to drive that bike off into the sunset. As for day two, this is a landmark event for the series, as I've lost the footage for the first time ever. Trust me, it wasn't so bad, especially thanks to drop difficulty, although if I remember correctly, the crew AI did refuse to target the biker boss, so it took my poor turret about five minutes alone to finally take her down. In any case, the biker heist was finally over. One of the big positives of dropping back down to Deathwish for a single heist was that it gave me access to an otherwise inaccessible pool of jokers, such as the shotgun wielding maximum force responder. Mewtwo over here is usually a powerhouse, so should be an excellent addition to the team. Back to the horrors of death sentence, it's panic room. This heist was massively considered in the planning for this run, and with my ability to mark targets and my AI's willingness to shoot at those targets, I'm hoping the sniper problem from the no shooting run might be solved. After sawing the room free and heading up to the roof, this seemed to be entirely the case, as the boys were making those pesky snipers their priority. However, the roof was painfully hot, making it impossible to actually hold a sniper killing position. At one point, I started having flashbacks to the Big Bank staircase that was body blocked from both entrances and was only saved by Dallas and Co rushing in at full speed. I tried setting up on the opposite side of the building, which was more sustainable, but did slow things down. As ever though, the key to panic room is patience. Off assaults, we could work our way back on the rooftop to pick those snipers set out in cover, and eventually, after a patient 14 and a half minutes, my Kingler took out the final two snipers and cleared the most demanding section of the heist. That wasn't as home free yet though, the staircase was starting to turn into some sort of shrine to the devil as corpse after corpse piled up, but my Sicario smoke made otherwise nightmarish objectives possible as I blew the hole through the building and set up for the escape. Now survival was all that mattered, so I set up the gang in the more open and defensible hallway and essentially hid out for 10 minutes whilst they held off the assault waves to get bile out again. I mean, just look at this mess, there wasn't a floor to stand on for the bodies, and my PC was really feeling the heat. Hell, at one point they even started coming out of the ceiling, affirming once again that Payday 2 is the only game with more hilarious bugs than Scarlet and Violet. But as you should know, once a heist has mastered the physics of the notorious diesel engine, there's nothing that can stop them. Meaning, we were able to hold through numerous assault waves before we'd killed enough for Blood God Bile to be content and fly off with the room, opening up the escape in the sewers. Not exactly my idea of a good time, there must have been more than 600 corpses left in that apartment block by the end of it all, but still, it was a heist well cleared, and I'm sure there'll be no long lasting mental scars. Don't worry, Door Medic cannot hurt you. Moving on from one sniper riddle map to another, it's Brooklyn 1010. Genuinely, I thought this one would be a lot easier, but Payday always likes to surprise you. Apparently, AI will not shoot at the targets outside of the building they're in. This is a pretty serious problem, as it means that neither my jokers, crew, or sentry are willing to shoot at the sniper to actually progress the heist. Now, from a few restarts and tweaking my useful bot settings, I was able to actually get Jimmy to shoot the sniper. Phew, problem solved. But then, the rest of the gang members arrived and my team went back into their pacifist state. Clearly there'd been too much killing for them to handle on Panic Room. I jest, but this could be run killing if I can't find a solution. And after multiple restarts, removable mods to see if they were interfering, and lots of trial and error, I learned two things. One, the team will only shoot the sniper if he spawns on the upper windows around their eye line. And two, they won't shoot at anyone else marked with yellow on the entire section. To put it simply, this forces my hand to use a lifeline, specifically Rule Breaker. As I mentioned when introducing it, I'm only allowed to break a single element of the run's rule set with this, so I'm declaring that for this heist only, I can kill enemies that specifically glow yellow. That includes the gang and police responders and the snipers in the second section. Outside dispatching of those specific enemies, I must remain a pacifist. 
This rule break cracked the heist wide open, but absolutely didn't make it a walk in the park. The close quarters holdouts on this heist are still absolutely brutal, and I'm forced to use many of the second string jokers to move through the heist efficiently. This means that my first full attempt, while not in pacifist mode, was still cut short after reaching the escape blockade, as I'd failed to grab a hostage early on. To make matters worse, I had to keep resetting until the first sniper spawned on the upper windows, as for some reason, he doesn't have a yellow outline, making him off limits for my weapon. Several brutal restarts later, I was so impatient that I rushed to move the cars immediately, unsurprisingly leading to my death, yet again without a hostage to bring me back. Remember, the second section of this heist is so punishing with its spawns that I often had to use up my Stockholm Syndrome revive just to escape it. Soon after this last second failure, I was given the 6 dozer spawn lock again, and despite my sentry gun holding off what seemed like an entire army for a while, it was too overwhelming for the crew at such close quarters, and I decided we'd be better off restarting. On my penultimate attempt, I left the crew to fend for themselves for a couple of minutes, and proved that I am the issue, as these guys survived an incredible onslaught by chain reviving. This was enough to bring me back for the latter half of the heist, only for the most tragic of interactions to occur. After around 30 hours of gameplay, I was finally tased into committing a murder. I mean, I'd say this was more of an assisted suicide, as this bloody taser decided to walk inside me just to eat up those bullets. But the rules are the rules, and the Arceus can judge me, and I'm pretty sure that one's getting a guilty verdict. As the runs went by, I have to admit I was starting to learn some safer strategies, making it through to the parking lot consistently to hold down for the escape. My persistence being rewarded in the end, as Twitch just decided he'd had enough of this messing around and steamrolled his way directly through the police cars, granting me the 10% chance at a much easier escape objective. Whilst this death sentence experiment started nice enough, the last few heists have really worn me down with their length and difficulty, and as I've now dinged level 100, things will only be getting more difficult from here on out. So I needed a short break from my frustration, but the yacht heist isn't exactly the ideal place to go when acting like a primate. My earlier frustration is pretty clear from the rushed and erratic gameplay. And on this run, I was just a couple of money bags from accessing the control room when I was spotted. But sadly, with berserker skills, just a nice love tap from my weak SMGs are enough to kill a man. Who'd have thought? And from there, the mistakes kept coming, as this guy was apparently killed by shock, as I seriously doubt that the butt of an Uzi would be enough to kill even the most brittle of humans. Eventually, after more 10 second attempts than I'm willing to try and commentate over, enough was enough and I got my head together, securing all the money bundles in under 4 minutes, and then controlling the only guards in my way with a little intimidation. Now, why couldn't I just do that from the start? The wick jobs now complete, it's time for a few more classics before the final sprint to the Payday League. As has been the case for all power defense style objectives, the team on this challenge run are well equipped to handle undercover with ease. And before you ask, torture is permitted within the Jokerman handbook, so I'm not breaking any rules tasing the taxman. At close range, my favorite pair of jokers were so overwhelmingly strong, even minigun dozers were having a tough time competing, meaning I was able to clear this one without any serious scares quite easily. The same cannot often be said about Slaughterhouse, which was set up to be a real problem without any active combat lifelines in the vault. The one thing that I could count on though, was my crew's ability to help carry the heavy goals throughout the map. Sadly, attempt 1 was aborted when I completely failed to keep track of the loot, choosing to restart upon entering custody for a second time, instead of flailing around fruitlessly trying to recover it. Run 2 went a damn sight better, as this time I was able to cleanly drill through to the gold and start moving half of it via the conveyor belts. By the time the crew had traipsed over there with the other three, I was missing just a single bag and had plenty of banked resources to keep going. On my run back, I'm not ashamed to admit that I received some god-tier Sicario dodge luck, allowing us to regroup with a final bag once Holston made his way across. Sadly, in the scramble to secure the last bit of loot, I lost track of Mewtwo's health bar, resulting in my rarest remaining SWAT going down trying to protect Hoxton. In actuality, even after confirming all the bags, we weren't out of the woods yet, as I was having to risk my own life to maintain that of my Jokemon out in the open. In the end, it all proved to be for naught as I accidentally interacted with a hostage for a millisecond, which caused Staraptor to disappear into the ether forever. The kind of mistake that you feel in the pit of your stomach got worse seconds later as I was punished and forced to use my only Stockholm Syndrome charge. At this stage, I was out of heavy death sentence powerhouses to call upon, so I was left with the likes of Swallow and Shiny Golem to hold off the endless waves of spawning cops. Fortunately, they were enough to buy time to access the escape, an opportunity I grasped with both hands thanks to the innate survivability of Sicario. This was a huge clear to get under our belts, but of course came at a heavy Jokemon cost. 
Now we move on to the final chapters, which get more and more combat orientated from here on in and fit our rule set less and less. I was surprised by how manageable Beneath the Mountain felt from my first time through it though. It did look like we were leaving Dallas behind at one point, but the crew managed to get back together and push onto the surface of the compound. Here's sadly where things started to unravel as we got absolutely peppered outside of cover whilst attempting to refuel the helicopter. As I played through a second time with similar outcomes on the previous objectives, I ensured that I'd record the captured murky water heavies, new units for the collection, to properly set up for the escape. While still by no means easy, the Diglett brothers provided a whole extra layer of protection. Hell, it seems they've even taught Jimmy Dig, allowing him to revive me in a much more enthusiastic way from literally beneath the mountain. Even with those extra precautions, this was still an incredibly close call as I hit grey screen right as we flew off, abandoning the rest of the team to apparently fend for themselves. But don't worry, our humanitarian approach was rewarded as not a single medic was harmed in the completion of this heist, at least not by me directly. Oh well, we can still chalk that one up as a victory, bringing us on to Birth of Sky. I've been dreading this one ever since I moved up to Death Sentence, it's just such an open and punishing map. Attempt 1 went off at breakneck pace. I was able to fix the broken bundle almost immediately and secure it soon after. Sadly, for whatever reason, despite being plainly in sight, Locke was refusing to acknowledge the other two bundles, which was, to be honest, infuriating. By the time he paid any attention to the car shop crash, I'd already lost more precious downs and was left making insanely risky sprints to keep the run afloat. Even so, I did manage to secure both, but without a Stockholm Syndrome charge, I made the mistake of bashing my head against the sewer entrance, dying once, twice, three times, in about as many seconds. Not ideal right before the all-important escape. That in mind, I made a death charge before leaving the crew to fend for themselves and hopefully bring me back from the brink. Alas, as I took a glance at Dallas, things were looking grim, although Jimmy did seem to be sitting this one out, finally trading me into a completely unsalvageable position, ending in the failure of this heist. Attempt 2 was put into jeopardy when I raced across the map to save the now level 100 RK9 from almost certain death, at which point I ended up replacing him in Beyond. Attempt 3 was far cleaner though, much like the first, as I was again lucky to have all the pallets spawn on just one side of the map. Under cover of ECM feedback, I was able to briefly convert the turrets and strap the chopper to the final bundle beside the diner before fleeing into the sewers with three lines remaining this time. More haste, less speed was the phrase of the day for this one, as it was key that I sent my crew members ahead to clear forwards and take a little heat off me as I rushed to the second grate to place thermite. Once through, I was basically in the clear of this roadblock heist, but it was then I remembered my ever faithful Swallows. Without any armour, his poor FBI body would be torn up in those tunnels, so I went back in an attempt to rescue my old friend. Uh, just out of range, but if I could just make it to the escape whilst his health pool held out, we'd be in the clear. I raced, first on the boat and then on foot as I realised that second wind may make me even faster than the dinghy. Thinking nothing for my own safety, it happened. Swallowed, fell. As fast as those legs could carry me, it simply wasn't fast enough, as that moment's hesitation is what sealed his fate. I took this loss poorly, but we didn't have the time to mourn it. Heat Street follows on from this, a heist which I attempted to rush straight through, going down a couple of times in the process, but still making it to Matt in pretty much record time. It was then that I realised that poor Badoof had been left out to the walls, unable to break the constant flinching that was preventing him from joining up with the main group. After the mistakes made on Birth of Sky, I wasn't letting that happen again, running out in the open and flanking around the back streets to bring him back from near certain death. Regrouping with the gang, we easily pulled Matt out of the van and started to push forwards. Bulldozer roadblocks certainly slowed things down, but we were never ground to a complete halt. An ECM helped me get Jimmy back up, and as the assault wave faded, we were able to push up onto the road. Active Core AI made this infinitely easier than on regular challenge runs, as they split the aggro and helped Matt up to the clearing, where we were able to secure our escape without a single loss, and without a single dead civilian, which is easier said than done regularly on the highly populous heat street. Now, I'll be the first to admit that Green Bridge did not stand out as being a problematic heist on paper, but let me tell you, with its frustrating escort mechanics, lack of cover on all sides, and constant need to be on the move, it's the antithesis of what we like heists to be for this run. Attempt 1 displayed this perfectly, as we were able to get the prisoner moving easily enough, but once at the scaffolding, it became more than the crew could feasibly handle. Losing my ECM and sentry early on can't have helped either, but protecting the Fulton chair on the rooftop felt almost impossible as a pacifist. There were just too many angles, and even if I was alive, the rest of my crew couldn't hold out outside of cover. 
Run 2 was a step backwards if anything, as we weren't even able to push the informant up the stairs, being blocked off by an unmovable army of heavy SWATs, who actually managed to physically blockade the entrance with their bodies. Custody was our end this time around. Attempt 3 was the product of some of the most fortunate timing we've experienced yet, as this time the assault wave was only building as I looked to push into the objective. This gave us the space to slip in and eventually get set up on the rooftop. The key here wasn't to protect the rooftop actively, but instead maintain control of the staircase closest to the chair and block off the usual entrances to the top floor. The gang did a pretty amazing job of holding off the swads whilst tanking up an entire helicopter turret for all of 5 minutes. Who needs realism when you've got access to an army of men who spawn out of thin air to fight for you? I glided my way to the escape zone, pushing ahead of my jokers, which ended up being fatal for both Turtwig and Shiny Golem. I was about 5 seconds away from joining them as my dodge luck briefly left me and I was forced to make a pretty wild charge for the escape zone whilst on my final life. Phew, we can breathe again. And whilst it only took 3 attempts, I actually think if I hadn't managed that godlike RNG run, this one could have been the roadblock that derailed the entire run. Sometimes, these things are just meant to be. After all, had that not happened, you wouldn't have been able to watch me die and fail Alaskan deal after being sniped about 10 times in one heist. So much for that good fortune. Ah well, Alaskan deal is on the easier side of the heist to come, so a second try was enough to get the job done. Again, splitting my forces to protect the pump and engine for the refueling was a successful strategy, and I was blessed with great timing for an instant boat escape. Sad that getting down just 5 times is now becoming a statistic to write home about. That's what Death Sentence has done to me folks. To attempt to break the cycle, I planned to stealth access into the vault of the diamond, which was looking incredibly doable from the get go. All I needed now was to subdue Garnet Jr. without anyone seeing… ah great, at least I was able to get a good way through the hacks without trouble arriving. With that done, I had to get the CFO up to Bane on the roof. Here's where the police really stepped up their efforts, apparently sending ghost type cops who could climb directly through walls. Pursued by the supernatural or not, we were still able to push out across the rooftop, securing the package which Bane proceeded to drop out the sky almost immediately. Not to worry, we had the passcode, and all I'd lost was, oh god damn it, the sentry is not living through anything anymore. Without it, I'd have to again test my ethics up against a machine. Following through on violence this time, I'm blowing the damn thing up. That's revenge for my boy. Notice this doesn't count as a kill, so we're getting off scot free. Now we just need to take two trips with the diamond to secure them from the high rise courtyard. It was incredibly open, but I had enough living distractions on my side to keep the heat off as I juggled through my now expanded roster of mid strength death sentence zeals, who held off admirably. One of the easier death sentence clears, in my opinion. But straight from easy to hard, we now need to tackle reservoir dogs. The first day went without much of a hitch, it took bloody ages to find the diamonds, but our speciality is holding out in corridors forever, meaning the initial clear was all but secured. I even had time to showboat on the escape, apparently riling up Cloak Kind by permanently brandishing a smoke grenade instead of my weapon. Oh, close one mate, but not quite. Day 2 though is where the madness can take hold. First it was pivotal that I acted fast and took the undercover agent hostage. She is the final joker in the decks that I have to obtain and she's completely unique to this heist. But after confirming her place in the team, I still needed to survive the entire day. The initial ambush was a lot easier to defend against than it is solo on Deathwish, but everything after that feels levels above, especially with multiple SWAT turrets giving my entire crew problems. We held out against multiple bulldozers next to the vault, as I used the lulls in the action to run outside and grab any necessary tools. This got us in easy enough, but it would be getting out that caused the issues. Even with a team of willing bag carriers, it's not as easy as you might think to carry a set of 6 bags of diamonds across an open road. I loaded the boys up and made the rush across, but the turrets were absolutely brutal, dropping me completely, even through Sicario. The only reason I was able to keep us afloat whatsoever was feign death activations and some legendary dodges. How exactly I got Jimmy back up then, I will never know. The problem was, I was desperately trying to grab a bag off his back, not realising in my panic that the reason I couldn't was because I was already carrying one. In the end, I pulled us back inside to regroup, before having to risk it all once again to keep Doug Trio out of the strangest shaped coffin you could imagine. Alas, for Crobat, it wasn't enough as the turret claimed yet another prize. However, with a self arrive still ready to go, I now had the fire in me, choosing to send over a few bags first for insurance before darting directly to the car with my crew acting as bait, which was just enough as they caught the bullets for me and I returned from the dead to secure the final set of diamonds and race for the exit. Once again, the crew stayed behind and confirmed a momentous first time victory for the good guys. Brooklyn Bank is another area defence style heist which suits the challenge perfectly as my only downs came from securing the tools to crack open the vault. 
The gang was comfortably able to defend the winch, with a real litmus test for how easy a heist is being, did the sentry turret survive? Just this once, the answer is yes. More enforced stealth now as we take on breaking feds, and I really want to highlight just how saucy this play was to make it through security almost immediately. Sometimes, during a challenge run as brutal as this one, I just need a little ego boost, alright guys? I was packing C4 on this one to keep the guards marked as it was crucial that they didn't spot me, and all was going brilliantly, until, hmm, did you spot the mistake there? Because I sure as hell didn't initially. As it happens, if we slow things down and focus our sight on the interaction button, you might just spy that for a brief second we were able to press F to turn our C4 back from sensor to explosive mode. Surely this won't come back to, oh, uh, yeah, he blew up. Genuinely, this made me jump out of my seat. What a strange and slightly stupid interaction. That most unfortunate of failures, of course, opened the floodgates for my ego to take a battering once again with three more quickfire cockups, two of which looked play for play almost identical. But eventually, I was able to rekindle the hope I had during the first run and grab the coffer directly from Garrett's office. We're on the home straight now, just a few more heists, and I can barely give my itchy trigger finger the exercise it desires, but not yet with Henry's Rock. Now, if you've thought at any point in time, this run is pretty messy, he sure goes down a lot, I recommend lucking away now. You see, in the computer room alone, I went down four times and was forced to make that Hail Mary play in running back to the doctor's bag. In doing so, I made just too much distance between myself and Miltank, who was left alone after I'd already been forced to withdraw Bidoof. Without his partner in crime, he was lost, meaning I was forced to watch helplessly as one of my oldest and most key companions returned to dust. Before we'd even hit 10 minutes in this heist, I'd already used up all medic bag charges and gone into custody twice. But we weren't stopping there. So long as the gang had juice in the tank, so did I. I pushed on through my least favourite Henry's Rock objective, the tech lab, charging up the weapon before, again, leaving the boys to fend from themselves. But fend they most certainly did. This was their time to shine. Yeah, Wonk is no longer the protagonist of this story. He's just the facilitator. The boys fell dozer after dozer, Jimmy putting in massive damage over distance, Hoxton ripping off their faceplates and Dallas finishing them off up close with his shotgun. The dream combo was in place. All I needed to do was stay alive long enough to progress us through the heist. So I scrambled, zapped, screamed, and carried, finally taking charge of the final coffer and making my way to the exit. With the crew leading the final push, I could follow up and make a quick attack on the turret circuit boxes, briefly turning them to our side in one of my favourite moments of the run. With my dying breath, I called upon Bile, leaving it all up to the crew. And with the turret at their side, the four managed to hold the line, not just survive, but repel the cops until that most important line of defence fell. Then it became all about survival. As I rejoined the fight, in truth, I became a burden, but at the very least I could call the boys back and create a distraction, fighting and retreating all the way back to the main hall of the compound. Trust me when I say that despite being a glorified spectator here, this was one of the most intense payday moments I have ever had the pleasure of experiencing. And as the herd thinned and the assault wave came to an end, we could breathe once again, carrying the artifacts over to the bile and escaping into the smoke with no lives remaining. What an achievement by the boys. Also, have you ever seen someone go down 32 times and still be thrilled by the result? This has been a real perspective warper. But whilst that felt as climactic as it comes, we still weren't over the line yet. Shacklethorne Auction required a slightly softer touch as I decided to stealth for as long as was feasible, managing to effectively cut this heist in half by already accessing the auctioneer's office before breaking stealth. Although it's an incredibly fast-paced heist, the crew was up for dealing with the rapid spawns of Shacklethorn, buying us time for the helicopter to arrive, which I fled directly towards once it did. I believe this makes it the first no-down loud clear we've had on Death Sentence. Onto Hell's Island, another heist that requires things to be killed, but isn't quite as specific about who does the killing, so I was able to quite easily force my way through and even return for the second roll of Thermite without my customary entrance into custody. This meant that we could free Bane and even heal up free of charge, leaving me really well equipped for the final section. Mostly, I just hid in corners and cheered from the sidelines as the rest of the team kept Locke out of danger. Even the sentry did an incredible job, sacrificing itself to cover the rear spawns, as Dallas, adorned in one of the most epic outfits I've ever seen, saved the day once again, and ensured a first time completion of the heist. Now with only two heists to go, I had to test something. What happens if you spawn a joker, when in stealth on no mercy? Okay, not surprising, it alerts everyone. Oh lord, but the game also kind of assumes you're still getting detected, so every cop on the map, my jokers included, have an exclamation mark over their heads. 
If no mercy isn't usually messy enough, this was going to be something else completely. Despite the visual bug, the cops were very much aware they were here to fight. But at this stage, with so many powered up allies and a pretty decent understanding of how to get the most out of my Keeper's orders, we'd become the immovable walls. Hell, just look at this. Hoxton and Dallas lost an entire hospital worth of blood and are still bleeding out of thin air, but seem to be A-OK, -okay, all things considered. In fact, they were so supremely confident, Dallas even found the time for this strange tender moment with a Skulldozer. But when it came down to it, they were ruthless when they needed to be, and were busy turning the Mercy Hospital into a scene resembling a completely different Japanese animated series. When it was time to grab the patient's samples, I actually experienced a bit of luck unlike anything I've seen before, collecting high concentration tests three times in a row, which is unheard of for me. That gave me the insurance I needed to call up the elevator and secure the samples at once, escaping the heist without running into any problems at all. Which brings us onto the finale. The White House. Only a champion Jokemon trainer could make it through here. I decided it made the most sense to attempt to follow the Shacklethorn auction strategy, at least wanting the Piot keycar before I went loud. Initially, this ambition was just met with failure and restarts, but after getting caught out in the Oval Office, I decided I could give loud a try. This was a monumental error of judgement. Trying to hold the line in this room is comedically difficult. Within seconds I was being rushed, the exits were being barred, and crew members were dropping like flies. With no way out, I quickly ended up in custody, even through Stockholm Syndrome. So that's about 8 deaths in a minute, setting all the wrong records here. But that just meant that I got to watch the crew fight the most unwinnable battle I have ever seen. Seven doses spawned, meaning it was almost impossible to even see Jimmy and Dallas from within the mass of writhing Kevlar and metal. Somehow, the two managed to stay alive through a revived chain, but all that meant was I got to fit in a few more completely unavoidable deaths as the world collapsed in on me and my sentry. At one point I was so utterly body blocked that I physically couldn't move. What the hell was that? Sometimes you feel bad about failing a heist, but that time I'm honestly just impressed. Nice to get a sneak preview of Payday 3's take on Death Sentence difficulty I suppose. This did kinda prove my hunch though. To make it through this heist, I needed to get at least halfway there via stealth, and on my next attempt, I got it together, quickly hacking a path into the West Wing, finding the USB in the Roosevelt room, and getting the Piot keycard. At this point, I'm in two minds. Would a full stealth clear be too anticlimactic? Well, I wouldn't have to wonder for long, as I was caught on camera rushing past a pretty random and irrelevant guard. The most idiotic stealth break I could ask for. I guess it was a bit of provenance. Although, I hate it for what it made me fight through instead. You see, the Piot holdout on death sentences every bit the climactic battle you might expect. Swats come at you from all angles, and turrets like to spawn to ruin our day even further. The new pairing of RK9 and Badoof were doing incredibly well holding their own, until I eventually repositioned into the conference room, which was not as defensible as I would have liked, forcing me to use Stockholm Syndrome shortly after. But as we know, being in custody is not the end of the world for a Jokemon trainer. All that matters is the timers keep ticking. And with the incredible aid of Sicario, I was able to keep things rolling through the first hack. After that though, things got even crazier as I tried to hold the staircases down to avoid the turrets and instead ended up losing my own sentry and life shortly after. But once again, the crew held out until the end of the assault wave, meaning my torture could resume. With this life, I made it through hack number 2 before again being sent to spectator mode. This is turning more and more into a Pokemon game the further we go. The saddest thing is that with each new life, I was having to sacrifice even more of my Jokemon just to keep the whole crew afloat, with Zangoose and Gengar going down, then later Tentacool and Metapod. Finally though, once out of custody again, I was able to complete the third and final hack and access the pardons, clearing the toughest section of the heist. Or so I thought, as in a moment of unparalleled stupidity and cowardice, I chose to sprint to the exit, thinking this was the end, leaving all my precious teammates to die. Not only was this a slap in the face for all that they'd done, it felt like I'd surely doomed the run as doing so entered the endless assault, preventing me from bringing them back from custody, all whilst I still needed to call in a chopper and now couldn't afford a single down. But we weren't giving in. This is the Jokemon challenge, and whilst the Jokemon still stand, so do our chances of victory. So I ran and I hid. I simply needed enough distractions to hack and disable the anti-air, but with Dozer spawning in and me down to my weakest Jokemon, surely this was impossible. I quickly recalled Beedrill and brought out the rare Scyther, at least being heavy he had armour and could stay alive just a little bit longer. Jigglypuff made the most valiant sacrifice, distracting a large number of mercs on the opposite side of the map, granting me just enough time to return to the White House to try and find a way around this. Both Scyther and the newly spawned Dunsparce went down, leaving me to call on just Venonat and a vast group of very injured companions. 
but I still had a half health Kingler and I still had a plan. If I could lure the cops back over to the building and leave Kingler there, with his health pool I could potentially buy enough time to finish off the hack and escape in the chopper. There was no time for sentiment now, Venonat was already dying and acting part of the plan. I simply had to get back out to the console and once again Dodge came in clutch, keeping me alive as I Goomba stomped this guy in the process. Venonat went down as I completed the hack but this was also a necessary sacrifice as it gave me the room to spawn in the ever consistent Diglett, who still had a good chunk of health remaining. Kingler kept fighting, drawing the attention of most cops on the map, as I looked to the skies desperately. There it was, all at once, in one of the most anime moments of my payday playing career, my smoke grenade helped me absorb a barrage of bullets as the merc seemingly flanked Diglett at just the wrong moment, Kingler fell in the distance just as the escape became available, and I, with some miraculous dodge luck, was able to jump to the chopper and complete payday 2 as a Pokemon trainer. That was the coolest finale to a challenge run I have ever had the pleasure of enjoying... enduring. Honestly, at this point, the overwhelming feeling for me is relief. What an incredible way to end the run. After seeing that, there is a small part of me wondering if this all could have been done as a regular challenge run without AI, but let's be fair, having the AI with us has also created some pretty legendary moments as well. Of course, before I go, we have to take a look and remember the winning team of Jokers who made it through it all. Here's the full list of survivors, with many not really being seen as they weren't in the load list for every heist, but in particular, a huge shout out to the Zeal Heavies who made Death Sentence possible, of course Diglett, Duck Trio, Arcanine, the many Fallen, including Miltank, and finally, the King Bidoof. He, over many heists, achieved 912 total kills and dealt an absolutely breathtaking 1,296,869 damage. That's equal to 27 minigun doses on his own. He truly was top of his class. And finally, to Jimmy, who was MVP on the most heists, making 4,873 kills in total across successful heists in the run. What a hero, that's why he's my boy. Overall, I do feel as though this one is going to be a difficult challenge to top, it's also by far the longest, but I'm still working on a full planned challenge run document so keep your ideas coming my way. Who knows, it could be your challenge that has me almost in tears at the majesty of it all next time around. Thank you so much for watching and your fantastic support in this series so far, if you keep enjoying them, I'll keep making them, it's as simple as that. So I'll see you all very soon. A huge thank you to my dedicated Patreon backers. If you want to join this crew in Going Infamous, check out the link below and pledge as little as $2 to see your name in the credits, or get 24 hour early access to future videos and vote on upcoming content. Take care, I'll see you all soon.